Hi, everybody. I'm here with my good friend, Adrian today. I'm looking forward to you having a chance to get to know her just a little bit. So Adrian, introduce yourself just a little bit. Tell us where you are from, where you're living now, places you've lived in the United States. Okay, yeah. Um, so my name's Adrian. I grew up in Michigan and I lived there until I was about mm, 22. And then I moved to Washington state. And um, when I was in Washington, I gave birth to my daughter, who's 12 now. And after Washington, I moved to Southern California. And I've been in Southern California since uh, 2016. Awesome. And that's where I met Adrian here in Southern California. So, but I want to get on to our topic today. Adrian is uh, mom, as she mentioned, and she recently went back to school to graduate school in, in fact, and did that not only as a parent, but as a single parent. So tell us a little bit about what careers you're changing from and why you made that choice. Well, when I went to college right after graduating high school, I studied interior design. And then I decided it wasn't really what I wanted to do. I really enjoyed it in a lot of ways, but it also wasn't very meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. And so I left Seattle and I actually went up to Alaska and I worked on uh, trails in Alaska. I led what was called a youth corps. So it was teaching uh, youth, which for that program was ages 15 to 21, I think. And we taught them job skills and they came from all over Alaska. Wait a minute. Did I know this about you? <laughs> I'm not sure you did. This I was, don't think so. While I was doing this job, I became pregnant with my daughter. Okay. And so I know, I think I've told you before that I spent the first trimester of my pregnancy living in a tent in Alaska yes. and that, during that job. So, oh my gosh. Yeah, you, it was you're really one of the coolest people I know. <laughs> <laughs> you are. <laughs> I got to do some really cool things in Alaska. We did some trail work. We helped with a helicopter drop of materials in kind of the middle of nowhere to build essentially an outhouse. Um, wow. We, but when I finished that, I was ready to have a baby. And so I went into mom mode. I did a little bit of design just here and there for small projects that people, you know, just wanted help, you know, revamping or kind of renovating a, a room in their home or something like that. Mm -hmm. But then after a while, I decided I needed to do more and I did more training to become a health coach first. So that was just working with people if they had a goal for their health that they wanted to reach, then I would just support them in that. And that was really fun. And so I did another training in what is called Ayurveda, which is Indian medicine. It's like ancient Indian medicine. So it was a lot of similar work, just, you know, helping people with their health and wellness, which I loved, but I kept thinking I want to do more. And so finally, I decided on when I was taking my daughter to an occupational therapist to help with a whole bunch of different things, um, mm -hmm. I thought this is the coolest job in the world and I want to do it. So I started um, taking classes so I could apply to graduate school to become an occupational therapist. So, so tell us what even, even with English as my first language, I sometimes have a difficult time understanding the difference between an occupational therapist and a physical therapist. Mm -hmm. uh, but what is an occupational therapist? What, what in general does an occupational therapist do? Yeah. So we, that it's really misleading because occupational therapy sounds like I help people find work. Yes. Right? Because we talk about what's your occupation is a, right more advanced word for the word job or your work. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's very confusing, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we are 
sort of a sister science to physical therapy. So you're mm -hmm. right that it's similar. But for us, occupation means anything someone wants to or needs to do in their life. You know, usually things that you would do every day. So it could be if someone has an, an injury or an illness and they need help learning to get dressed again. You know, if they mm -hmm. broke their hip and they're recovering, I can mm -hmm. show them new ways to, you know, get their pants on without hurting their hip again. Okay, so and I want to back up just a minute because there's a very interesting little piece that uh, you went by there. Adrian is the author of a published book, co-author, I guess is what you would call it, with another woman. And some of you may have heard me talk on live videos or in classes, if you've taken a class with me, about the help that Adrian gave me with my health issue. Um, digestion, a digestion issue. Digestion is how we process food in our body. Um, and she wrote a book. Just tell us briefly about that book and then we're going to go come back here. So tell us just the title of it and what it's about. Okay. So the title is uh, Mind Body Cleanse. So your mind and your body, because it's a cleanse that works on both. Um, but it is based on ancient Ayurvedic medicine, which, like I said, comes from India. It's about 5,000 years old. So, you know, it's a little bit, they've tested it a little bit over the last 5,000 years to see what works. And we call it a cleanse because it cleans your, your body and your mind. Ayurveda had already established a cleanse plan. Mm -hmm. And we wrote the book so that you could do it at home. It's an awesome book. I have the book. It has been super helpful to me. But let's fast forward back to where we were. Um, and so you decided you thought being an occupational therapist would be really cool. You want to do that. So then how did you proceed to start meeting that goal? Well, first, because I had been out of school for about 13 years, which is a little bit unusual in this country to, yes. you know, because the first part of school after high school, we call undergrad, undergraduate, yes. and mm -hmm. I got my bachelor's degree. And a lot of people will go right from their bachelor's degree into their master's degree. So usually those two are related. But mine yes. and so just for everybody, your bachelor's is four years right after high school, usually you start when you're about 18 years old. And you graduate when you're 22, and then you go right to your master's degree, which is usually one or two years. And you usually start that when you're about 22, 23 years old, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And most of the people that I went to school with when we started were about somewhere between 22 and 25. Mm -hmm. There were some people who are a little bit older, but I was, how old was I? I was 35 when I started. And because my, my first degree was really different than what I wanted to do now, I had mm -hmm. to take, they call them prerequisite classes. Uh, so, or we'll say prereqs for sure. Yeah. So these yeah. are classes that if, you know, if I hadn't taken all these certain things during my undergraduate studies, I had to take those in order to just even apply to the program. Yes, yeah, so okay. I'll talk just a bit about that word prerequisite comes from the word required. So pre means before, requisite means required. So she had to take classes that were required for her new major before she could start the new major. And prerequisite is what they're called, but she's totally right. People say prereq. We, in the United States, I think in other English speaking countries too, we shorten a lot of words. Yeah, it's just a mouthful, prerequisite, you know? Yes. <laughs> it's a lot to say. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's easier to say prereq. And this is a great way to sound more natural when you're speaking is to, is to use these shortened versions. They're easier and you sound more natural. So it's a win-win. <laughs> and so I found a school really close to me that's actually a very good school. And so I looked at their list of what their prereqs were. Mm -hmm. And I just started taking them. And um, until I got to the point where I'd taken enough, it took me about a year 
to get all of my classes done so that I would be qualified to apply to the program that I wanted to go to. And I nervously submitted my application and waited and waited. And, and I did get accepted on the first try. But I know a lot of people who don't get accepted on their first try. It can be very competitive. Right. So I felt really lucky that, um, that I got accepted on the first try. And I think that I was nervous because I was an older student and I had been out of school for so long that that would count against me. But it actually was in my favor because of the type of work that occupational therapy is. It's very helpful if you have had life experience in lots of different things, which I have. So that turned out to really benefit me. <laughs> That's awesome. And I was just going to say, you said you felt lucky that you got in on your first try. I'm sure it had less to do with luck and <laughs> more to do with your life experience and all that you bring to the table. When I say when you bring to the table, I mean, all that you offer, all of the um, experience that you have to offer. Mm -hmm. I do think that's true that I showed yes. on my things that I put on my application that I just thought, well, it's not related, but it's what I've been doing for the past 10 years. It was actually, it, they were all the things that they wanted to see. And I found that actually working in interior design actually fits into occupational therapy in a lot of ways that I hadn't expected especially totally. that I did, had done a lot of classes on universal design, which is designing spaces so that anybody could use them instead yes. of most spaces. We just design them because they look good. But then if someone were in a wheelchair, they would go into that home and they wouldn't be able to use the kitchen because the counters yes. are too high. But universal design is designing it from the beginning so that anybody could use it. The doorways are wide enough for a wheelchair. The countertops are low enough for a wheelchair, things like that. So I found yeah. that there were actually things that I had learned all along the way that fit into occupational therapy. Absolutely. And we call this transferable skills. You're touching on one of the most important things I tell people who are, who are um, changing careers, knowing what your transferable skills are is super important <laughs> to changing careers. So Okay, so you got accepted, you tell us what it was like to be in the program. Like I said, not only as a mom, but a single mom at that point, right? Now that you got mm -hmm. into the Yeah. So yeah, that and was top totally all, different. Yes, and I was commuting almost an hour each way. So I would drive yeah. an hour to school in the morning, and I would drive an hour home. And I would still have to do all of the things that a mom has to do every day. So yeah. it was a lot, but I'm very good at managing my time. <laughs> so yes, that helped. Um, but I, I did notice that there were a lot of my, my classmates would say, I don't know how you do it because they felt very overwhelmed with the amount of work that our program entailed and they weren't commuting and they didn't have children. Most of them. Mm -hmm. I think I had... I had one classmate who also had a daughter and I had two classmates who had babies while they were in the program, which mm -hmm. that to me was like, I don't know how you do that with a brand <laughs> right. new baby. They need yes. so much work, you know, so much love and care. So, and yeah. of course, you know, my daughter needed a lot, but she was a little older. And so she could, you know, kind of do some things for herself. You know, like go to school. <laughs> yes, she was in school all day. Yeah, where yeah. babies are not in school all day. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes, you know, she could make herself some simple meals. And mm -hmm. over the last three years while I was in school, she learned more and more different things to cook. And sometimes she would make me a lunch or a breakfast or something like that, which was really sweet and really helpful. Super, super sweet. When I spent time with your daughter, she would make me lunch or breakfast too. And it was so sweet. Yes, and she would make them so beautiful. She would yes. like cut strawberries into heart shapes and decorate the plate, you know, just the sweetest, the sweetest things, you know? Yes. 
So believe it or not, we've already been talking for uh, quite a little bit. If you were to wrap this up with something you would say, well, two things. The first thing, um, something you would say to someone who's thinking of changing careers, they know they would love to do something else, but it feels like such a big change. What would you tell them? How would you encourage them? Well, I would say do it because, you know, especially for me, if, if my heart is really in something, I'm just going to do it, you know, and the deep trying to work out all the every single little detail before it happens is just going to make you crazy. So jumping in and just trusting that things are going to get sorted out. And, you know, even for me as a single mom that I didn't have a lot of help with things, but that's how people came to me along the way, including you, Tanya, that it was like, <laughs> help, what am I going to do? I need someone to stay with my daughter while I have to do this other thing, whatever, you know, and it all, it always comes together. It always comes together. And to me, it's more important to be happy than it is yes. to feel just like, okay, I'm staying in my, in my comfortable place because that's not where growth happens. Exactly, exactly. And everything you just said, I would also apply to someone who has a goal to learn English or become fluent in English or improve their English. All of what you said applies to that. But specifically, I know that learning a language is not your goal. But if you were to say something to someone who has a big goal like that, Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. what is something you would say to them when they just feel like I can't do this anymore? It's just too much, or I don't know what to do next. What would you say to them? Mm, I would say break it down into smaller chunks and mm -hmm. just do what you need to do for that day. Don't worry about the rest of it because I know I have felt like that where things feel really overwhelming and how am I going to get it all done? And I ended up spending a lot of energy um, worrying about how I was going to get it done instead of actually applying myself to do what I needed to do that day. Yeah. And I think of especially like taking my board exam, right? I had to take this really, really big test in order to get my license to work as an occupational therapist. And it was like so much information, you know, huge. Um, we just have so much that we need to know about. And um, I got a, it's essentially a, like a study program that broke it down for me into little chunks. And it was so much information, but I would just go to it every day. It didn't matter if I felt like, oh, I'm excited to do it, or I'm dreading it, or, you know, I'm tired or whatever. I would just go to it every day. And I would do the section that I needed to do for that day. And then I would just move on. And if I felt like, I, I got through all the material and then I would look back and say, okay, but that part needs a little bit more of my attention. So I would go back and I would repeat that one or just study more on that one. But I didn't let it stop me when I was doing it. And I felt like I wasn't doing very well. I waited till I got yes. through all the material and then went back and did a little review on that because it's like, I know some, but I'll, I'll polish it up later, you know? So just yes. for me to just keep moving forward and, and to be evaluating like, okay, now that I'm, you know, to where I wanted to be, what, what can I get a little better at to improve everything? That's, that is an awesome way to handle it. And my students have heard me say very similar things before. I swear I didn't tell Adrian to say this. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot tell me to say any of that. No. But we do think no. a lot alike of a lot of things I've noticed. <laughs> yes, it's true. It's true. Adrian, thank you so much for taking some time to be with, here with us today. You use some great phrases. I know there's going to be a lot of students that are really grateful to hear yet another native speaker speaking. Um, so thank you for taking some time to be with us here today. Oh, thank you so much. It's really fun for me.